good to be home. It is my home turf. In fact, I just flew in from London an hour ago. But this is my hometown. And um, I have been doing uh, the BAM events around the world. And so it's really fantastic to be in the hub of innovation, to be at a place where people are very open to exploring new ideas and um, are accustomed to the risk that it takes to both launch and scale new companies. So I, I really want to push the boundaries on what a business as mission is, right? What, where our horizon is, what we can succeed at doing. Because I think at the beginning of the BAM movement, it was more of a philosophy. And now we're moving more into a strategy. Um, now, I am not the most likely uh, person to be uh, necessarily doing social enterprise. I was a uh, venture capitalist here in, in Silicon Valley. And one day I discovered that my favorite restaurant here in the Bay Area was the center of a human trafficking ring that brought over 500 young women, teenagers, from the area of Bangalore, India, into the Bay Area, first for working in the restaurant, and then taken out to fruit and vegetable fields, taken out to brothels in Northern California. Human slavery in our backyard. Uh, not for sale, my organization, we've done a report on slavery in the Bay Area. And we saw that there are very heavy incidents of, of human trafficking in the East Bay, here in the South Bay or Silicon Valley, and in San Francisco itself. And it's just shocking to know that this takes place behind closed doors and even in open uh, spaces here in our Bay Area. So, you know, when I discovered this, this is about 11, 12 years ago, I was, you know, I was just so um, overwhelmed, I felt like I had to do something about it. And, you know, I, I, I really do want you to be attentive to this weekend since we're on the first night, is that, you know, we say, what does God want me to do, and what should I be doing with my life, what is the purpose of my life? And I, I got to tell you, I think we believe we ask the question, and I've changed my mind, I think we are asked questions. Right? What answer do we give to what comes into our life? And I can't tell you why that particular event, because I'm sure thousands of people or tens of thousands of people went to that restaurant, but for me, this is a calling. I had to do something about it. Right? I didn't need to go home that night and think, gee, I wonder what God would want me to do. Right? So be attentive to what comes into your life. Because the answer that we give to those alive events is the answer we've already given to our journey. So for me, it meant I needed to uh, figure out how 30 million people in the world were facing human trafficking, modern slavery. How did it work? I was, I'm a curious person. I had both the compassion for these young women, but also the curiosity, how could it happen? I needed to understand that. So I took a year leave of absence from my venture capital bank, and I went around the world. And I actually followed the money. I went from the Bay Area to Bangalore. I went from Los Angeles, where I discovered there were 112 women locked into a factory and forced to work sewing clothes and then to be locked and chained to their bed every night. So I went to Thailand from there. I went from Houston, where young girls in cantinas will line the bars with numbers on them. And a man will come in for a drink and say, I want number seven. And he can buy her for a night, a week, or as long as he'll pay. And I went to Guatemala and Peru. So I, I went around the world, followed the money, went to every continent. And really my purpose, you know, here's the other thing when you say, okay, I need to do something. I have a calling, but I don't know what I should do. Like, how do I address an issue like human trafficking? Or extreme poverty or HIV AIDS? Or, you know, these large issues, I don't feel like, well, what can I do? And, and actually the answer I discovered is to take one step. You just take one step. And, you know, my one step was, before I was a venture capitalist, I was an investigative reporter. I used to write for the New York Times, the Chicago Tribune, Wired Magazine. And so uh, I said, okay, I'm going to go around the world, investigate it, I'm going to write a book, and then I'm going to go back to my life here in Silicon Valley. Just take one step. The problem with taking one step, I do warn you, though, is you have a second foot. All right? The other one's like coming behind. You're not sure where it's coming from, but it's coming behind. And 
little did I know I would meet this woman when I went to Thailand. Her name is Kurnam. She is an artist. She wasn't looking to solve the problem of human trafficking any more than I was. She just discovered young girls and boys that were being put into karaoke bars in northern Thailand, in Chiang Mai. And so when she found out about this, she was such in a rage, in a righteous rage, she just ran into the first karaoke bar she could find. She grabbed two little girls and a boy and ran out. It's not the most sophisticated intervention strategy. But I understand her passion. The next night, she runs into another karaoke bar. She grabs two little boys and runs out. When I meet Kunam, she has 27 kids and no plan. I had four kids. I had no plan, but I did have a job, okay? And so Kunam was living on this piece of property on the border of Myanmar or Burma and, and, and Laos, so the Golden Triangle. And it was one structure, a palm leaf roof, four wood poles, and 27 kids living on the dirt. You know, I often think about this because I know anyone in this room had gone on that journey with me. You would have said, I need to do something to help this woman, right? You would have figured out, you would have made a promise. And I made my promise, and that was my second step. I'll build a house for you and your kids. All right, so that was my one promise. So I come back to San Francisco, I'm beginning to write my book about human trafficking, starting in the Bay Area, then going to Thailand, and I get a communication from Kunam that that one hut that they had, that one shelter, had burned to the ground, they lost everything. So I said, okay, you know, oh, the second part, and by the way, I've rescued 53 kids now. <laughs> I'm like, slow down on the rescues already. So... I said, okay, we'll build two houses. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm a professor at the University of San Francisco. I get to assign books. I'm going to make sure every student reads this book. That's the beauty of being a professor, right? <laughs> so this is my plan. Then before I could even raise the money or the, finish the book, I should say, she calls me and says she has 88 kids. So I said, okay, we need a village. And I know I'm not that good of a writer, so... I start with my partner, Mark Wexler, who's here today. We start now for sale as an international NGO. Don't ask me why we built Victorian homes from San Francisco in northern Thailand. <laughs> okay, promise you, I had nothing to do with this, nor did Mark. We go there and we find out that they built these homes. We're like, what in the world? It looked like hate street, right? So we now had a village, and it grew to 150 kids at any one time. And over the last 12 years, these kids have been going through as they get to the age of 18. Our strategy is most of them are stateless kids. And I know some of you know what that means. They're, it's like undocumented kids. They're not from Thailand. They can't go to school. They can't go to clinics. So we really worked hard on getting them into schools. And so the strategy being if you can graduate from a Thai university, you have a fair chance of being a, becoming a Thai citizen. And you become less vulnerable. You become less exploitable. So these kids, they grow their own food. We got them into schools. Uh, it's just an extraordinary story in northern Thailand, and it's still going today. You know, Mark and I got so inspired by that. By starting off for sale, we said, okay, let's do this other places. So we went to Vietnam, and we went to uh, Romania, Peru. We started, started, we started shelters around the world. And... You know, as inspiring as it is, and I, and I really do feel proud and I'm really happy that still today I can do the work of Not For Sale, I also need to confess to you that after about four years, I started having this gnawing feeling that I am at the end of a river pulling out bodies as they're drowning and they're flailing. And I figure I, I need to go upstream and figure out how to stop it. Right? I could be at the end of the stream with these kids and how are they falling in? And how do I stop this? That was the first thing. The second thing is, it hit me. You know, when I found out about human trafficking, I opened my heart and I shut down my brain. What I mean is that I was a venture capitalist in Silicon Valley. But when I found out about human trafficking, did I go out and try and find capital? No, I would beg you for a donation. Did I get the best talent? 
No, I go to Stanford and Berkeley, I give a talk about what I do, and inevitably a, a, some student would raise his hand, Professor Batson, I love what you do. If I can't get a job at Google or Apple, I'd love to come work for you. I'm like, what the hell? Why would I want you? <laughs> right? Because there's this presumption if we're doing a cause, it's a purpose, it's a mission, it's a nonprofit, we really don't need talented people. You got a pulse, we'll take you. <laughs> right? I mean, any dummy can start a hedge fund. I need smart people, right? Thank you. Okay, so, <laughs> so talent, and then technology, I get secondhand computers. So I say, something's wrong with this. Like, I would never do this in Silicon Valley. So I began to think about how do you, you know, one, start slavery, stop it at its roots, but two, how do we come up with a new business model for addressing the things we care about? How do we change our business model? And I think that's why many of us got in this room today. We're interested in changing the business model to pursue the missions that are most dear to our heart. And so, you know, I decided that I was going to bring together, talking about talent, I'd bring together the 50 smartest people I knew. And I didn't know a lot of you then, so I'm sure you'd be in that 50 now. I brought, you know, the founder of Twitter, the founder of the largest healthcare company online. It was a, a baseball player with the San Francisco Giants. It was uh, the largest bank owner in, South, in Australia. I brought 50 people. I said, look, it, I need the talent of what you've accomplished, what you've achieved, because I want to address the problem of human trafficking. And I want to do it with a scalable, viable business model. <coughs> Put those two things together, right? So essentially, this is what Mark and I show them. Okay, I made an irrational promise during this event. I said, whatever idea you guys come up with, on Monday morning, my team and I will do it. Stupidest promise I ever made. Because they came up with an idea I knew nothing about. Now, imagine you, you're sitting here today, and I say, you know what? Monday morning, I want you to start a beverage company. And you're like, what? Right? So this is how I felt. So, okay, on Monday morning, I said, okay, I need to get out of the mentality of, you know, being in a church or being in a nonprofit. What do you do then? Oh, remember that woman that had that lemonade recipe? And we could sell it on Sundays and take it to the rotary, right? No, okay, I said, what would I do if I was here in Silicon Valley? I would go out and find the best beverage maker in America, right? You try and find the talent. And I went to the Academy Award of Beverages. There's such a thing. I'll get you a ticket next year if you really want to go. And I found the guy. He had, made it, he had won the award the year before. And then I went to him and said, look, we have this great idea about sourcing from the Amazon of Peru, these herbs, turmeric, matcha, uh, gaisana leaf, uh, maca. All right, okay, these great herbs. We're going to put it in coconut milk. We'll sell it in Whole Foods and then eventually Kroger and Safeway and Ralph's. And then we'll take money back to the communities. It's a beautiful idea unless you're the one having to do it. And so, I, this is what we want to do. You know what? And we're not for sale. We're a nonprofit. We can't, I know Pepsi wants you. I know Unilever wants you. We can't pay you what they pay you. But no, you don't do that. You say, you know what? I know what Coca-Cola is going to give you. I'll match it. I'll give you as much money. There's a lot of money. And I will give you equity. You can own 10% of the company. And you, we want you to create the best beverage in the world. Just take a second. Why wouldn't we do that? You see, our ideas are better than those ideas out there. Yet, we choose tools that don't allow us to reach our goals. We don't have the aspiration. We don't have the courage. We don't have the dream to go out and find the best talent, to find capital, to, to make those dreams come true. Because if you don't have those things, I don't care how, much, how many hours you work, we're never going to achieve it unless we get super lucky. So I said to him, you know, this is what we'll need to do. And he goes, I'm in. I go, wow, okay. Tuesday morning, how the heck am I going to pay that guy? <laughs> right? Okay, so, but when I'm in Silicon Valley, what did, I, what did I used to do? Oh, you know what? I've got the best beverage maker in the world. He's joined my team. Last year he made this beverage. It's incredible. He's joined us. You want to, and the idea is great. And I got investors. Right? And then the story goes, within 18 months, 
We put Rebel into New Leaf, which is a Bay Area grocery store. You have one in Santa Cruz, one and a half Moon Bay, little one, right? And then we went to Natural uh, Markets, and then we went to Whole Foods, and then now we're in Target, and we're in Mainstream, the largest, uh, fastest growing organic health beverage in America today, right? From just an idea. Crazy, huh? All right, but this is the thing that's really powerful for me. One is that we commit ourselves, and we have in the Articles of Incorporation, that you have to source for impact, not for profit. So when we source matcha, we look for the place where we can have the most impact on people and planet, not where we can get the cheapest matcha. Imagine how that changes everything. See, I used to be in the 80s in a nonprofit where I would work in Latin America helping farmers grow and learn cooperatives. But the problem is there's no market for what we wanted to sell. I said, okay, in my next life, which I did in this life, I'm going to come back and have demand. Because once you have demand, then you can make decisions strategically on supply and with your values around supply. So we started sourcing in the Amazon of Peru. And the beverages just keep growing, so we now source in 32 countries around the world. And Rebel gives 2.5%. Every time you buy a bottle of Rebel, money goes back to those communities. Over a million dollars from not, Rebel has gone to not for sale to support the communities around the world. Yep. So, you know, I have some of my investors here. This would never happen without the investors. But you choose investors who believe in your dream. Because it's difficult some days early on to have everyone believe, right? I remember how much revenue do we have and how many people are we helping? And I'd say, pretty close to zero. The tough message to give your investors, right? So the strategy that we now use at, at Not For Sale is, okay, we intervene. We get people out of trafficking, like the 150 kids that Kurnam rescued. That's intervention, and in that intervention, we learn where these people come from. In Peru, we learn that most of the kids in our shelter came from the Amazon. They're from native tribes. So how do we go upstream? How do we start looking at the assets in that community that would create long-term change? And then we build an enterprise to solve that problem. I'm helping 150 kids in, in, uh, in Thailand. Enough sales helping another 100 in Peru. Look at the scale when you start addressing enterprise as well. Today, we have 12,000 families who are sourcing Rebel. 45,000 people over and against 150 people are being benefited. Right? That's what scale does. That doesn't mean you betray your mission. In fact, you have to set the foundation of your mission embedded in the company. But you need to have the same principles that anyone else. You know, who's my competition? My competition isn't the First Baptist Church Lemonade. Right? My competition is Coca-Cola. Unilever. I want to take them down. Who drinks that silly crud anyway? Right? All that sugar, obesity, blah, blah, blah. Be a rebel. Right? Drink differently. Okay, this is not a commercial. Okay. I get lost in that sometimes. Okay. So... Then it's impact, right? Like, how do you really know? You, how do you make sure that you're actually doing what you're saying? It's not just a slick marketing message, right? And this is really important for a company because as you get rolling on your operations, it's like you get lost in the everyday, just making sure you have enough operating capital, making sure that you're getting product to market and that, you know, the supply, it's just endless. You all know this. And then at the same time, that heart for mission, how does that, how does that beat strong and how do you make sure you're doing what you're saying you're doing internally to your own team and externally to your customers? So I personally go to the Amazon at least two or three times a year to go down and visit those communities, to actually see, not just get a report, but to actually see what impact we're having. Right? It's so important. And it, but it also inspires me. It reminds me why I do what I do every day. And we need those reminders. And so, you know, I, I love seeing the, you know, these kids who are now going to school and, and they're, they're uh, you know, the ones that were being trafficked into our shelter are now staying in their home community. And we're putting resources and infrastructure and we have study groups and you see a difference happening in the lives of those communities. And that's when it's worth it, right? When I pick up a bottle of Rebel personally, 
I feel them. And then I need to communicate that message to our, 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 our fans that they start to feel that. And then we really are a different product. We really are something different as a brand. We stand for something more. So when I went down recently, it was about two years ago, I was with my son, Zach, and he's at, the, at a table here. You'll get to see him this weekend. And we were going up, and he was documenting with film our story. One of our, our directors from Peru said, hey, um, look at this shoe. And he brought a shoe. I look kind of like a beat-up Tom shoe. All right? And I said, well, where'd you get that? He goes, well, you see that cotton over there? He goes, that grows wild. That's like in 13 colors. You know, I, I thought cotton was like industrial cotton that was like white from the ground. It's like 13 colors of, of, of brown and red and blue. It's really uh, remarkable. And then it says, okay, and then over there, the tree, what we do is we cut it like maple syrup. We make a cut and we capture the latex. And then the farmer will tell you, you see the, on the left side, that's where my grandfather cut this tree and got his rubber. And on the right side, that's where his great-grandfather got that. And so, you know, Zach and I looked at each other and said, let's create a shoe company. Okay, I know I'm crazy. A shoe, a beverage, and I have other ones coming. But it's not even about the product or the service. It's about the vision. It's about the belief in the vision and getting the right talent around. I know David's shaking his head, and he's done the same. We weren't trained to do what we do. But you do it. Right? You do it, and you figure it out. And I don't try and become the best beverage maker in the world. That's not my gig. I try and be the best business operation person I can be and get the right talent. And, of course, then you got to look at the market. you got to look at everything. So, you know, for me, it's really important that, uh, you know, I, I'm a... I'm really, really impassioned about putting values in everything we, we, we do. Meaning this, I don't have to drink people's tragedy in the morning anymore. I don't need to wear their suffering. I don't have to trample their dreams with my designer shoes. I kept choices, and this is what many of us in the room are doing. We're trying to create companies with values behind them. Create companies where you feel good. I know the family, I know the names of the family who produce the rubber on my shoes. I know where the cotton's grown. I know the families who are picking it. I have that relationship, and I know they're being paid fairly. I know they're living dignified. Their spiritual communities can take root. They're not being torn apart and exploited. I know that, and I can communicate that to my audience. And shouldn't that's what we should be doing of people of faith, people of spirit, people of hope? is not just simply sending a donation once a year, but actually embedding every day the values that we believe in. And we can do that. Uh, you know, in fact, what I'm going to give you an opportunity to do, my shoes are $120, my Z shoes. If you Venmo me at Z shoes before I walk off the stage, you can get them for $69. You just have to go at Z shoes, Venmo. All right, it's good until I walk off stage. And then throughout the weekend, you get it for $79, $119, or $120 shoes. All right, now I got that out of the way. Now you start thinking about, by the way, we have to be selling all the time. Seriously, right? You know the sale you don't ask is the one you don't get. And what shoes do you have on? See, I'm going to be really, most of my closet is filled with shoes that are going to be in a toxic dump in three generations. My Z shoes are returning to the earth. They're so vegan you could eat them. <laughs> right? That's a better idea. That's a better idea. And what we need to do as entrepreneurs, people of mission, is to come up with better ideas. It's a better idea to have a shoe that is giving dignity to the people who actually source the materials and returns to the earth in a way that gives dignity to the earth. That's a much better idea than a Nike. Why do so many of us buy Nike? What has Nike done for us? They've given us toxic dumps and exploited kids in the factories. What have they given us? But I love my Nikes. Why? Changing brand loyalty is very difficult, right? Starting a company, Z Shoes, we're, we're moving along, but it's so like a steep hill because people have an incredible loyalty for some reason to the brands that have nothing to do with them. But I love my Adidas. I love, I'm not going to beat up on Nike. Adidas is just as bad. 
I want to have a shoe that I stand on my values. All right? Just saying. All right, so then you start thinking about this. How do you start to embed this in other areas of the kind of projects that you do? At, you know, our, our, our other companies, that's going to tell you a couple of others, just to show the range of companies we're trying to work with and the challenges of that. Uh, one is you've had a square bar in front of you from Square Organics. We, uh, we started first as a protein bar. And then as we've grown, we said, wow, that's a really tough market. You walk into a Whole Foods or, you know, a Safeway, and you just see this, like, wall of protein bars, right, or energy bars, or, like, Cliff, Kind, RX Bar. You know, it's a, it's a really crowded market. So we've created our niche. We have about a 2% market penetration of, of the, that protein natural bar, but we know we need to shift away. We need to have another kind of product line and not simply bars. So we're going to open up the aperture. We're going to open up our products, start experimenting with what are functional foods when you don't have time to cook that make you healthier, right? Make, give you better choices around when a mom is putting in her lunchbox for her kids or her father's making the lunch, putting stuff in the lunch. What are better alternatives? And it's not just protein bars. There's other things or things when I can't make lunch. Maybe I have a superfood protein shake. Right? So those are things that we're experimenting with. i got to tell you, creating that kind of impact has been really, really difficult with this company because the margins are so low. The margins are so low. So sourcing ingredients that we know have a better story and have a better impact when none of our competitors are and you know, your margins are razor thin. It's really tough. Coming up with products that actually tell a better story really requires ingenuity. So I, 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 if I told you this is really simple, Chris Wexler, who's the CEO of here, is here this weekend. I hope you get a chance to talk with him. He has been a magician. He has been a miracle worker dealing with very difficult market competition. So even in a very difficult market competition, if you don't stand true to your values, if you don't stand true to the excellence of your operations, then you'll, you'll fail. It's so critical, so important to get there. So, my dream is that we can have business as mission across every sector. We can have it in beverage, we can have it in food, we can have it in shoes, and indeed, we can have it in technology. All right? So, our latest company that we uh, came up with out of Not For Sale, and our investment company is called Just Business. Our latest uh, company is a tech company, and it's uh, born here in California. And essentially, what we looked at is trends, future trends. And so what I really want you to think about and come away from this weekend is as you think of a business idea, where is the market going to be in five years? Right? Where is the market headed? And how do I start creating a niche service that begins to address those needs? Right? Instead of saying, wow, Facebook was really big 10 years ago. I'm going to create a Facebook for chiropractors. I hate to tell you, but most chiropractors are already on Facebook, right? So instead of looking back at what has worked, how do you look forward and see a trend as it's developing, right? This is why if I go back at Rebel, Rebel was a completely different beverage where it was using super herbs and it was about organic beverage at a time when Coca-Cola and Pepsi and other beverages are going down. People are looking for better alternatives. In fact, if I were to ask you in this room, how many of you are eating healthier today than you were three years ago? Almost everyone would raise their hand. Raise your hand if you think you're eating healthier today than you did three years ago. Now, look around the room. As an investor, as an entrepreneur, I got to think, what does that mean? Right? What does that mean in terms of market? And Square is going to be on the front edge of that, being just one step ahead. You don't want to be too far ahead of addressing that demand for better food. I think the same with apparel. I don't want to wear toxic materials. I want to know the story, be particularly for millennials and Zs. They care about what they wear and the story behind it. So again, how do you start companies? This one was an interesting one. It's called Relocity. And essentially, it looks at the fact that we're living in a world of mobility. We live in a world of mobility. And so some people are in mobility are in refugees. Some people are in mobility or human trafficking people. They don't get a lot of services. And, you know, really for Mark and I, I was like, well, how do we come up with 
a way to address this area of mobility, get funding for it, make it scalable. And, you know, it really, you know, it hit us. We met a guy named Klaus, who's going to be here this weekend, Klaus Siegmund, who went to companies in Silicon Valley and in Los Angeles, uh, Silicon Beach, and said, you are dealing with mobility every day. You're hiring the best talent you can find. So take Apple. They're hiring people from all over the world. And what happens when someone from uh, London or someone from uh, Shanghai comes to the Bay Area? They have you know, a difficult transition. They need to find a dentist. They need to find a place to live. They need to find a bank. They need to find... And so what Relocity does is that we are an Uber company for relocation. We take care of those needs. And there's nobody doing it. So we created an app. And the app is like, okay, I, uh, I just moved here. I need a dentist. I have a molar problem. One of our concierges will come, and they will help you find your dentist and give you an appointment and set it up. You just have to walk in. And so this became such a demand. Netflix wanted to be our customer. And then uh, uh, Apple, and then Facebook, and then Google, and then Salesforce, and then Starbucks, and then Walmart, and then Nordstrom. And it's, it's crazy how fast this has grown in two years. In fact, I presented this to BAM two years ago just as an idea. And it's just blown up since then. I mean, I, I, if you remember that story about this company, I can't even believe how quickly it's growing. Now we're in Europe, we're moving to Asia too. The idea being that, you know, what, what I love about it is that Apple said, okay, you know what? If we're helping people in mobility, every one of my employees is in mobility. And so I think, wouldn't you love it if you got 10 hours of concierge services to yourself. It's like having a personal assistant for 10 hours. Because I don't have time to change my bank. I just keep my same bank because I can't go down there and change it, right? So imagine someone takes care of that for me. Or my, my babysitter gets sick. They help me find a new babysitter. All right, so they're making it the new perk. So every employee will get 10 hours of concierge services. And that's why when you're trying to choose between going to Apple or some other company, you're going to say, do you get velocity hours or do you get a concierge, right? That makes it a competitive venture. Meanwhile, we take 1% of all that revenue and we devote it back to people who don't have a concierge, people who have been forced into mobility. People are moving to an area because they have been either exploited or they're refugees or they're escaping a situation of, 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 of unrest. Now they have a concierge, right? So velocity is relocation. These ideas are all about rethinking the future, innovating the future, but instilling in it the faith, the values, and the hopes that we have as entrepreneurs. And I got to tell you, you need to embed them deeply. It has to be in the DNA of the company. You can't bold it on and say, you know, one day we'll give a, you know, some percentage of net profit. It needs to be in the way that you run the company, the way you hire people, the way that you actually structure the company needs to have the very values that you start that company with. And you have to live by them because they're in your articles of incorporation. They're in your board structure. You're, every part of it is you're reinforcing the value that you started the company with. I'm super excited as business as mission because my question is, what other kind of company would you want to start? What other kind of company would you want to start? You know, it's funny. I was in uh, Sweden talking to a, 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 a big group of corporate leaders from across Europe. And before I was to go on stage, uh, they had like a, a reception hour. And I was sitting there, and a guy from Swiss Bank uh, came up to me, um, Swiss Credit. And he said, or Credit Suisse. He said, so what are you doing here? And I didn't say I'm the speaker today. I said, oh, you know, I always have to make a choice. You see, if I say, oh, you know what? You know, I, I run this nonprofit not for sale, and I start companies that, you know, try and give it... They, you know what happens? Exactly what he says. He goes, you know what? You should talk to my philanthropy department. All right? But in this case, I said, you know, I could, I'm going to be a venture capitalist who does good. I'm not going to be a social activist who tries to be a business person. So I said, oh, I'm a venture capitalist. And he goes, well, what kind of companies? I told him about Rebel. I told him about Relocity. I told him about, he goes, oh, oh, wow. You should talk to my philanthropy department. <laughs> right? It's that perception that somehow we're not doing real business. And so I want to build the day when I said, what do you work for? Credit Suisse. They go, oh, really? 
what are you folks doing about poverty in the environment? He goes, what do you mean? He goes, oh, of course, business is 21st century, you must be doing that. Right? But flip it. I shouldn't have to feel that I'm on the back foot being an entrepreneur just because I'm creating companies that are making a better world. And that's the hope and vision of this room.